Thanks everyone for uh, attending my presentation, Proprietary Interconnects in CXL. My name's Larry Carr. I'm the VP of Engineering at Rambus, as well as I'm president of the CXL Consortium. I've been asked to do this presentation as, uh, you know, as we look at the marketplace right now, there's a lot of discussion of proprietary networks, as well as some questions around the CXL adoption rate. And, you know, I figured that if we kind of go through the history of how we got to this point, you know, it could give you some understanding of how we expect the adoption of, of CXL and, and how architectures will change in the future. So. Hopefully you'll find it interesting. So CXL, we've been working on it for a long time, approximately five years. Um, you know, it's evolved from a, a small direct connect uh, solution, trying to expand, uh, you know, attaching, attaching accelerators plus expanding, you know, memory attachment. It's now grown to a full size fabric with switching and composability between. Uh, Accelerators, memory, and um, you know it's 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 gotten quite significant in in complexity. Um, you know, they're they're for the people who are kind of just kind of new to load store architectures. It's one of those things where you know a figure of CXL is the first, and it's not right. A lot of the problem statements that CXL are trying to address actually predate CXL. And it, you know, there were other interconnects, other um, protocols that were involved to try and solve what you know we're we're still trying to solve today, uh, as we see these greater, larger systems being created. So I'm, I'm going to go back in history, you know, probably about ten years ish, and uh, we'll, we'll we'll you know we'll see how the world had kind of gotten toward where it is. So if we go to the beginning, you know. PCI Express, you know, it's a great interface. Uh, it went through the great serialization event you know, sort of in the early 2000s. Uh, the other sort of parallel interfaces at the time also went through at, at the same time. And once we had a serial interface, people looked at neat new ways of doing things, which normally involves switching and fabrics and greater connectivity complexity. PCIe Express is just a serialization of a protocol that dates back to 1991, where we created PCIe, you know, designed for peripherals. It's fundamentally a load store interface, uh, but it's not really designed for memory. It's designed for connecting peripherals. It, it doesn't mean it's slow, because if you go look at a Gen 5 SSD now, those things smoke, you know, pretty fast. But you know, it's from its memory connectivity, how it hooks into the processor, it's it's just not designed for load store and it's a low performance thing for when we just talk about load store. Um, of course, you know, people wanted to improve on that. I would say the first company that did that was IBM where they created CAPI, you know, trying to bring in new accelerators to talk to their PowerPC to accelerate certain workloads in HPC. Um, and they extended PCA Gen 3 and Gen 4, but it was a proprietary interface. They opened it up with the creation of the OpenCAPI consortium in 2016 to support all ISAs. Um, some very neat things were built with, with OpenCAPI. Um, and, and, you know, we'll see, you know, how that evolved over time. Uh, C6 also came in approximately the same time. Again, this is where they're trying to bring in cache coherency as well as memory expansion. Um, you know, they were leveraging Gen 4, but they also wanted to go faster in non-standard rates. Uh, again, a group of companies got together to sort of create this protocol. It's been adopted by the military. I know it's in a few missiles, so. Um, and and you know the 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 you know the the, the the connectivity acceleration and memory expansion to a processor I would argue it's a it's a problem that's at least ten years old right and people you know invested time and effort trying to do this in both in proprietary as well as attempt to open you know from a standard point of view. 
Uh, stranded resources, especially in memory, you know, 2014, I would say, is the first paper you see it published publicly. Again, NSERC was looking at the workloads for their high performance compute systems. And this is where um, he had three high performance computes. They um, are, you know, ever increasing doubling of memory, plus the inclusion of the HBM. The problem with um, they were seeing is, is that while you know certain workloads were achieving um, being being able to expand and use all this memory, most of the workloads didn't take advantage of it. And and the most uh, damning event is if you look at Edison, which you know sixty four gigabyte DRAM per node, seventy one percent of that would fit in the sixteen gigabytes of HBM. That means there's a lot of wasted DRAM, right? And when you're talking about tens of thousands of nodes, this is uh, you know a waste of, of of resources, right? And with HPC, it's it's particularly bad because every node is running essentially the same program. There's no way of, of you know like the hyperscalers to kind of pack different workloads in. So you know it again ten years ago. We were struggling with memory, too much, you know, too much memory one one place and not enough in another. And uh, yeah, 2016, you know, the Department of Energy launched the Exascale Compute Program. They're trying to accelerate the ever increasing performance uh, of high performance compute, uh, specifically for the U.S. nuclear stockpile. This is a strategic initiative because exascale compute or exascale number of uh, floating point operations per second uh, was deemed, you know, key to uh, maintaining uh, scientific leadership in the world. Um, Department of Energy owns the nuclear stockpile, and they're responsible to, to you know, ensure it's to understand how its its life is progressing. Department of Defense tells you where to send it, right? Um, but they were looking to acquire three high-performance systems with exascale number of flops. And at the time, we were sort of in the 10 to 100 pentaflops. So they were looking for a 10 to 50x improvement to performance. So at that point, they they were funding you know, key initiatives. Path Forward was a key one to work on HPC connectivity. The leadership at the time was Slingshot, owned by Craig, a uh, very successful uh, fabric, but they wanted to see if an open fabric, um, an open standard could be created that would allow new features and functionality and performance uh, supported by the industry. So Gen Z was formed as part of the path forward efforts uh, to create an open standard of, of connectivity that could be used, you know, not just for high performance compute, but also for enterprise and cloud to you know, move memory and attach accelerators. And it's very similar to CXL 3.1 from, from a feature set point of view. They, they, you know, some of the connectors they defined are actually used within the industry today. Uh, and they got into things like optical and, uh, you know, probably ahead of its time in, in a lot of ways. Um, you know, it broad industry, you know, interest, but the adoption rate on the processor side, you know, definitely struggled. Um, so looking at the milestone, 2018, the first CPU GPU hybrid HPC system went online called Summit. Um, before that, it was all CPUs, right? So if we think about today where we're talking about, oh, we've got CPUs on massive scales of GPUs, you know, that first was done in 2018, which isn't that long ago. That's six years ago. And, you know, we're talking about, you know, 9,000, you know, processors and 30,000 NVIDIA processors tied together with NVLink, proprietary network, and, and InfiniBand. Um, and this was a leapfrog in performance. Um, you know, and this is where, you know, when we talk about the architectures today, a lot of them look like, again, six years ago. Um, the, the following generation of that 
uh, used um, was severely, they wanted to improve, improve the, um, the uh, DDR bandwidth. So instead of having parallel DDR um, interfaces on the processor, um, they used actually 16 open CAFI uh, serial interfaces. So they said, and they found that they got 2x the memory bandwidth to the core, to the processor versus a parallel interface because they could literally put 16 times more um, serial links in the same physical space to bring in the bandwidth at 25 gigabits per second. Uh, and they, you know, with the memory controller, they had less than a five nanoseconds impact on their read latency. Um, and because it was an open GAPI, the open GAPI memory standard, OMI, became, you know, it's a public standard. Um, they were the only ones that took advantage of it, but they they produced, you know, some very massive uh, memory bandwidth processors with this interface. Jetix standardized on a form factor called DDIM, an OMI DDIM. Microchip did the processor. I was involved in that. Um, and uh, you know, it, in a way, it looks like again something very similar to CXL, but uh, there was an attempt to to go open, you know, taking something that was proprietary. Um, in 2016, so in, in sort of the 2016-2018, we had sort of this explosion of um, new connectivity standards. I would say it's probably about ten. Um, you know, RISC V was bringing a couple of RISC V companies were bringing stuff in. People were really trying to solve this problem of memory expansion, memory movement, and sharing, and accelerators, and memory bandwidth to processors. And it it had different you know adoption by various companies. Um, the CXL founding members rallied around Intel, who who had their own internal specification, because they were looking at, again, a ten, uh, expanding uh, PCIe in a way to allow sort of, again, memory sharing and attachment to accelerators. And that that was, um, you know, what eventually became CFSL 1.0. Again, a group of companies are rallying around the standard and, um, you know, saying yes, we're gonna we're this is the standard we're gonna go on, and we will expand it. I think the key aspect of CXL that has made it uh, successful is you know by the CXL 1.1 timeframe, which is 2019, all major processor vendors pledge support for in their roadmaps, and that's a big difference from all the other sort of open standard approaches and proprietary approaches of the past. So, you know, what makes an open standard isn't just the fact that the standard is um, available and allows everyone to uh, uh, design to it. What makes it standard is adoption, and especially on the processor side. Um, that's what may, has made CXL to, to, to be as successful as, as, you know, from an adoption point of view, because it has portability between sort of key processors. Um, just to give you a sort of a, you know, exascale update, we did achieve 1.6 uh, high precision exascale flops in 2022. Uh, that was Frontier. Um, Aurora recently just got um, got uh, um, I reached it as well. Um, we did that with essentially 10,000 AMD processors and 37 AMD uh, GPUs, tied together with the proprietary network and the Infinity Fabric, as well as the HP's slingshot. Right, um, HP bought uh, Cray, and, and therefore uh, when HP uh, built the system. They used a slingshot process, uh, a slingshot uh, processor connectivity. So um, you know, it it is the most efficient HPC to date. 60, 63 gigaflot per watts still takes twenty million uh, a million watts to uh, to power the system, 
and that becomes a physical restriction um, mainly because a lot of these systems are like replacing previous si systems so there's a set amount of power already in place and 20 megawatts is pretty much the limit um, to give you some context three three vancouver sky rises consume about 20 megawatts right so everything's electrified cars all works it, each each tower takes seven megawatts we're talking a lot of power in a small little area um and there's now more exascale initiatives trying to do another 10x improvement which really is focused on power consumption because we really can't push into 20 megawatts um, um so then we, we so kind of circling back to proprietary network. The key thing we have to remember is, is that you know custom connectivity with will always exist, right? You know, the processor to processor communication, it's a point of, inter, uh, of, of, of innovation as they evolve their hardware architecture, the communication between things also will evolve, right? Um, there is, again, the two dominant sort of proprietary fabrics, uh, you know, NVIDIA with their NV Link, AMD with their Infinity fabric. They're not really proprietary in this traditional sense because they have opened up the fabrics. So you're allowed to partner with them to, to get access to the base IP it allows you to connect your, 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 your technology to the, those fabrics. But they're not open as in, you know, broadly adopted, right? But again, I think where you see is the industry is kind of woken up to that fact, right? So in the in the past, it was sort of like, here's something, it's wonderful. We will win on technical brilliance and everyone will have to adopt it. What what what's happening now? And I, I look at Ultra Ethernet. It's like okay, we want to you know as an industry, we have to improve this, but not just one person or one company can do it all, right? So we're seeing a lot more common ground finding. So while we look at these these accelerator fabrics, I think you know as the economies of scale come into play, as you know they want to start and to invest to to accelerate, you know. Their behavior may change, and I expect it to have changed. Um, but how they that will have, play out will be, you know, an interesting thing to watch. They work really well. These fabrics in connecting GPU to memory, uh, GPU to processor, or GPU to GPU. But from a memory point of view, they're really, you know, not not designed for it. You know, six L. Um, still plays a role in these architectures as, um, you know, again, from a memory expansion and memory uh, coherency, you know, the needs of the processors are different from the needs of the GPUs. So, you know, again, from a processor to processor or, you know, GPU to GPU, you know, you, you probably will see, see a, still a certain amount of, of company-specific dominant um, proprietary networks in that area. But overall, you know, um, that is not sustainable as, as this technology becomes more expensive. So final thoughts, um, you know, like generative AI was disruptive. You know, we had certain sort of key things the industry was working on that was from an open point of view, very well aligned to 6 sort of green initiatives where it's like, oh, we're gonna go DDR4 reuse or, um, you know, green initiatives and stuff like that. And we're now in a crazy phase. Like basically, you know, we just, we just can't get big enough, right? When we're talking about companies buying nuclear power plants to power their system, like that's crazy. So, <laughs> so, you know, like in the short term, yeah, you know, it's everyone's going to go probably again, innovate very independently, but, you know, given where AI fidelity is really a function of, of, uh, of, uh, you know, um, function of processing power right now, 
the only way we're going to make AI smarter, I guess, is to make it bigger. And, you know, you look at NVIDIA's uh, the Nando, um, they're at 93 exaflops, but they're at much lower precision. They're at 20 megawatts. And that, you know, expanding beyond that is difficult. So, you know, the industry needs to, to get more power efficient, which again is innovation and investment of research dollars. And it's, you know, again, back to the, uh, the economies of scale. So, you know, standardization, you know, JETIC and SIA and OCP and, and CXL, you know, it's it's great. It is the baseline that we need, but to to get, you know, the adoption there, it's also, again, um, one of those things aligned to, you know, the architectures and, and some stability such that it's like, okay, we're going to see commonality between these architectures to the point where, you know, they can take advantage of these networks. So, you know, I always like the uh, bird size uh, dog on the shoulder, um, but, uh, you know, that's, that's the problem we're going to solve, I guess. Uh, <laughs> so hopefully you found this interesting. You know, it, it will take time. CXL adoption, you know, it's relatively new. Um, and, um, you know, it's mind-numbingly you know, expensive to do silicon now. And, uh, you know, it's, it, without the standardization we have, have now, it, I don't think we would be accelerating as fast as we are. So thank you. And, uh, you know, please rate this session. Mm -hmm.